So good afternoon. My name is Tanya Easley. I'm a professor in the math department here. Um, I am going to talk to you about Lenore Blum. She is known in um, education realms as the accidental advocate or activist, and I will explain that uh, as we go through. Lenore is a distinguished career professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, she is computer science, she is mathematics, she actually has done research in several areas. Um, she is actually part of a program that is studying entrepreneurship right now, and I'll explain that in a minute also. She is the 2004 Presidential Award for Excellence in Engineering, Mathematics, and Science Mentoring. So she has mentored many, many people over the years. She was born in New York City, but very quickly, uh, at nine years old, moved to Caracas, her, uh, Venezuela. Her dad was in import and export, and so he went down with a business venture there. Um, moving down there, as they did, they didn't have a whole lot of money, so they were put in Venezuelan schools, which they didn't know Spanish, so that was a little bit hard for them. So she actually, quote unquote, quit school at nine years old. She was out for a year, and then they got on their feet in that year, and her mom got a job teaching at an American school um, in Venezuela. It was for the oil boom was there at that time, so they had lots of American oil men there. And so her mom got a job there, which meant they, they, their, her and her sister could go there for free. And so she went back to school. They put her back two years. She was a little aggravated. Um, but she quickly advanced. Most people at that American school, when they hit high school, came back to America and went to boarding school, and she had no interest in that. So she actually attended an international high school there in Caracas, and they would let her test out of subjects, and she ended up graduating at 16. Um, in her early life, she actually met her husband, Manuel, at 10 or 11. Um, their friends, their mothers were friends. Manuel is about four years older than her, but they met at 10 or 11, and then he went off to MIT uh, when he graduated from high school, and so they communicated via letter for several years, and so when she was ready to go to college, she was hoping that she could go to MIT to be close to him. So her love of math developed very young. Um, she found out that she was good with it, and she just she thought it was beautiful, and this quote is from her. So I found this great article. It's a two-part article. Um, and I have the link in the PowerPoint. I don't mind sharing with you if you want to email me for it. Um, that was an interview. And it's just, here's the questions and then here's her answers. And so a lot of the quotes here was pulled from that article. It's from the Berkeley Review in her words of different things that happened in her life. Her love of math, she says, I remember being in a tree class and seeing the proof of a theorem and thinking to myself how beautiful it was. Very early on, I felt that math was beautiful and that proofs were beautiful and, of course, that they were independent of anybody's interpretation or feelings. So she, she just absolutely loved just the beauty of mathematics and how it all worked together. So her road to activism started in college. She applied to MIT um, because it was an excellent place to study math. It had a great reputation for math, but also because... Manuel was there, and she wanted to be near him. But she was told that MIT was not a place for women. She says, uh, when she applied, this response she got was this. I applied to MIT. That's where I wanted to go. But I got a letter back saying all freshmen had to live on campus, and they only had 20 beds for women. That was 1959. So she had to find an alternative. And so women didn't study math in 1959. And so she attended Carnegie Tech for architecture. What she found out very early on at Carnegie Tech is she didn't want to do architecture. She thought she was going to love the combination of, fine, of art and math. But she didn't like the math that was required for architecture. She wanted to dive deeper. She didn't want formulas. She wanted to study the math behind the formulas. And so she started almost immediately trying to figure out how she could change her major to math. Um, she was turned away multiple times until uh, the first head of the computer science, um, Alan Perlis, at Carnegie Mellon, and he's the first Turing Award winner, finally told her, yes, you can study math. And so she began, she cha changed her major, 
began studying math, and then in 1961, she transferred to Simons College. It was a women's college um, in, uh, near MIT so that she could be near uh, now her husband. Um, and so she started there and said, there was a wonderful math teacher there. She said, you don't have anything to do here, so let's get you into MIT. So she was denied MIT, but she ended up at MIT because of Simons, and they actually paid for her to go to MIT as a special student. So she ended up being able to study at MIT after all. She did graduate from uh, Simons College. Um, she was told in an interview that it just wasn't a place for her when she reapplied for graduate school. Again, she was told not a place for you. But she had a lucky break. There was a professor there by the name of Isidore Singer who had been one of her professors, and he overheard a conversation with some other professors talking about that girl that was trying to get into MIT graduate school, and how odd was that? And he was like, oh, are you talking about Lenore Blum? And they're like, yes, and she's like, oh, you want her. She's one of the best math students I have. So her lucky break was that Isidore Singer called her the best, and so she managed to get in. And then her quote was, once you're in, the faculty was more or less treated you as equal, perhaps because they assumed you'd be a future colleague. So perhaps you were going, they were going to have to work with you in the future, so might as well work with you now, right? Um, she earned her PhD in MIT in 1968 and said, with the enthusiasm at MIT for my thesis and my postdoc fellowship, I thought, okay, I can go anywhere and people will surely appreciate my work. I did not know that one needs mentors and support structures. And she ran in quickly, quickly ran into a problem. So she chose UC Berkeley. First, because it reminded her of, the, of Caracas, Caracas, Venezuela. She loved the climate. The, the weather was kind of reminded her of her growing up years. The political climate at the time reminded her of her growing up years, so she chose to go to UC Berkeley. And thinking that she had graduated from MIT with her doctorate's degree or her graduate degree, um, she would be accepted there. There was also a mathematician named Julia Robinson that was working out of UC Berkeley. She was best known for the decision problem. And so she thought, I get to go work with Julia Robinson. She said that this paper, the uh, decision problem for fields, was actually something that just resided on her desk all the time. Like she would always look at it. So she was so excited because she could go work with Julie Robertson in uh, California at UC Berkeley. But what she found out is when I arrived in Berkeley in 1968, I was shocked that Julia was not on the math faculty. So she worked out at UC Berkeley, but she wasn't a, actually a faculty member. Never had a regular faculty position there. Um, kind of the dot, dot, dot. She talks about how Julia would teach a class here and there when they needed her but she was not a regular faculty member. I found out that the math department hadn't hired a woman in a regular position in 20 to 30 years. So she's moved across the country to go work for UC Berkeley, and they haven't actually hired a full-fledged uh, full uh, professor that was a woman in 20 to 30 years. So at Berkeley, she, she took off. She was still going to work. They offered her an assistant professorship at Yale. And um, she turned it down, number one, because her husband was tenured already. So she didn't want to leave her. She had had a young son, so she didn't want to leave them. But also because UC Berkeley offered her a lectureship and told her that it was basically the same thing. Okay. Um, however, her research was not really readily accepted because it was a combination of math and logic. And at the time... That was not a thing. You didn't combine math and logic. That was not meant to be. Um, they, she, def, she used number theory, complexity, computer science. All of that was in her research. And so she combined a lot of areas of mathematics, and they just weren't used to that. Um, she taught for two years and then wasn't rehired. What she was actually told, there were no permanent positions at UC Berkeley. Um, so at, that was kind of when her eyes were open. She kind of says the blinders came off at this point. Before Berkeley, I had not particularly identified with women scientists. In fact, at MIT, I remember being very happy when they wrote letters addressing me as Mr. Blum um, because I thought, well, finally I'm accepted. Of course, this was outrageous, but other women at MIT told me the exact same thing. Having blinders on has the positive effect of not taking things personally. 
But of course, having blinders on does not prepare you to deal with the bigger issues I faced when I got to Berkeley. I had no tools, I didn't have the support structures, and I didn't even realize I needed them. So she didn't have any kind of backing as to what she does now because she's not going to get hired on in a permanent position there. Um, so what does she do? Well, three professors in the Berkeley department decide that they're going to have uh, the series of talks and panels on the social problems connected with mathematics. And they come to Lenore and ask her to do one about women in mathematics. She says, I, I don't know anything about women in mathematics. What are you talking about? And so she finds three speakers. You can see there the speakers were Ravina um, Hilson, Sheila Johnson, and Elizabeth Scott. She invited them to be a part of a panel. And as a result of this particular panel discussion, she became the expert on women yeah. So now she had to really do a lot of stuff because she became that expert. That's part of the accidental advocate part. Like, she never thought of herself as an activist, but the things she did put her in line to be an activist. So here are a few of the things. There was no way I could list all of them. Here are a few of the things that she's done in her life to, act, uh, to be an activist for women in mathematics. She was a founding member and 1975 president of the Association for Women in Mathematics. That was one of the organizations that actually came out of UC Berkeley and her experiences there. Um, she is the founding co-director of Math Science Network and its Expanding Your Horizons conferences, which is a program encouraging high school girls to explore math and science. At the time, high school girls were kind of discouraged from going anywhere above the second year of math in high school. And so... Um, it's still, the program, Expanding Your Horizons, is still out there. They, they still do that today. Um, she founded the math and computer science department at Mills College. It's kind of a funny story. Um, when she started at Mills College, which is an all-women school, by the way, uh, the math department there, she started trying to bring in computer science in the math department, and they fired her. And found it, someone else found out, and they're like, no, you're not going to fire her. So they rehired her and just made her a whole new department called Math and Computer Science. And so it's still there today. And then um, she now teaches at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and she started a program called Women at SCS. And it's basically the basic goal of this program is to make sure that women are as represented in their computer science degree programs as men. And to date, they are at about 50%. 50% women, 50% men in their computer science programs. Um, while on the National Science Committee, she helped devise the visiting professorships for women. What this is is basically they took, uh, they take uh, women professors at teaching schools and give them a year at a research school so that they can experience the research. Because, you know, if you don't, if you've never experienced the research side of it, you really don't have a visual of what that is. And so, they did, she started that. She actually became one of the beneficiaries of the program also. Um, and that, she went to Hong Kong and studied in Hong Kong. And when she came back, she fell in love with research again. She kind of returned to that research vibe because she'd been out of it for a little bit with all the other things that she was doing. And she, she says in the article that I was, uh, the interview that I was reading, She's, I love this quote. She says, everything I've done, when I look back, was bridging different areas. Um, for my thesis, it was logic, model theory, and algebra. With these computational models, it was logic and computer science. That work took off and became the foundation for what's called computational mathematics. So she's always been about bridging that different areas together, that including her work in, uh, in, in bringing women into the math world. So her current work is actually pretty interesting. She started a program at Carnegie Mellon called um, Project Olympus. And it bridges the gap between university research innovation and entrepreneurial economy building commercialization. So the idea here was you've got all this great research happening, but what are we doing with it? So how about partnering with someone who's an entrepreneur that's looking for a startup and let's put y'all together. So she starts having these kind of like fairs, kind of show and tell. 
Here's what the research innovation is doing. Okay, let's see how we can commercialize this. And their first unicorn, Duolingo. So the Duolingo came out of her uh, program on entrepreneurship with researchers and innovation. They actually, the, that area of Pittsburgh is like number one in the nation for startups now. So she also is currently doing research on designing a computer architecture for a conscious ba AI based on cognitive neuroscience. I'm not gonna discuss how that works. It's not me. But that's her current work, um, and she was excited because her, she's working on it, her husband's working on it, and her son is working on it. So they have the potential to, to be able to publish a paper under the name Blum, Blum, and Blum. <laughs> so she was excited about that. So one of the questions on the interview that I was reading said, so what's your advice? What's your, any last advice you would give someone? And this is what she said. It's really important to have mentors and be in a community supportive of your work. I would say that's the most important thing. You can do it on your own. Nobody does it. On, you can't do it on your own. Nobody does it on their own. That's a myth. I don't think mathematics is just done in isolation. It's done in social, professional communities. And so that's her big thing. And that's the reason she won the 2004 Presidential Award for mentoring in math, science, and engineering, because she is big on mentoring um, and building those social communities to help women excel in mathematics. And so um, I have a lot of articles, but the ones from the Berkeley Review are the interviews that uh, were my favorite and pulled most of my information from, because it was a great interview with her. It was very interesting to read. And she is still at Carnegie Mellon today, so she's still working on her research. Thank you. <laughs>